Hi, everybody. Welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness. I am Cherie Burton, and this is a podcast for humans who long to feel, express, and be who they truly are. Uh, I want to start out this episode by making a little announcement. I do have the Instagram Cherie.Burton, but this new Instagram, Soul Essentials Cherie, which I said backwards last week, I said Cherie Soul Essentials, but it's actually Soul Essentials Cherie. Uh, I did a giveaway. And so the winner of this beautiful clutch and the accompanying essential oils that went with it for that giveaway is Ashley Woods, who lives in Minnesota. Her Instagram handle is rocks in travel. So thank you, Ashley. We'll be getting that sent right out to you. And I'm going to keep doing these kinds of giveaways because I love the devotional self-care piece of just nurturing yourself and loving yourself into new ways of creating state changes in the body through focused and intentional work with your senses. And that's actually what this episode today is about. I met Dr. Brian Falk a few years ago when I was um, taking a course at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California. He came in to do what I can only describe as the most amazing thing, <laughs> like this demonstration on how smell impacts the psyche and memory. And I've already been studying sort of this multi-sensory aspect of ourselves and how the senses are kind of our portals to feel good and to feel alive and to cleanse, I guess you could say the inner vessel and just kind of wake us up to, you know, our aliveness and as an antidote for depression and all kinds of things, just being present in the body. So I had already been studying that and I love essential oils. And a lot of you know, I'm a leader in doTERRA and I've been traveling around the world teaching about essential oils and their impact on emotional well-being for about 10 years. So to have him come in and do that and, and to get my hands on his fascinating book, Smell Your Reflections on the Soul's Meaningful Scent Images, was a huge nerdy treat for me. <laughs> so he has, uh, Dr. Brian Falk, he has a master's in Chinese medicine. He also has a doctorate in depth psychology, which is my exploration and why I was at Pacifica to begin with. But his doctoral research kind of took this interdisciplinary approach to investigate the psychology of aroma. So whether or not you use essential oils, this is not a podcast about essential oils. It's a podcast episode that dives deep into how sense smell, your nose, your olfactory receptors, your brain, your limbic system, how the ability to smell has an impact on how you feel and how you tap into your subconscious and how you actually have this whole connection to, or this bridge really between the personal and the deeply personal and how your brain is program to receive the sensory input and help you feel more alive, alert, and well, and also how it can trigger things. <laughs> So it's super fascinating as avenue to explore one more way for you to add to your devotional self-care and understanding how what you're smelling, both subconsciously and consciously, has an impact on your day-to-day -day life. Well, Brian, I'm so grateful that you've agreed to let me interview you. I kind of chased you down. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I saw you come into Pacifica. Uh, that's where I first saw you, I should say, uh, when I was doing... Um, memoir writing course there, right? Called Writing Down the Soul. And our mutual friend, Jennifer Selig, yes. connected us. She was actually the one who taught that class. And I love Pacifica. I love everything about the vibe there. Still on my radar to go get my, go into the master's PhD program for depth psychology with the Jungian archetypal studies emphasis. So that's on the mm -hmm. bucket list. But um, that is where I first met you. And it was like finding the aromatic Jesus when I met you. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> so I know that's like a lot, but it was like, who is this guy? He is like validating everything because I've been into aromatic science and aromatherapy uh, for quite some time and understanding mm. the link between mood and emotions and how emotions are chemicals and aromatic plant compounds mm -hmm. are chemicals. So to have you pass around what you did, which remind me, I know there was some, something about an old leather. Was it a book? Something you passed around that. Oh yeah. I brought in a few different objects. Um, and I think I did bring in, uh, some fabric or cloth, uh, something of, of the sort, um, to just kind of, get, of like, get the conversation started. I don't remember what I object it was that was, but, uh, I don't, 
an old book. Yeah. yeah that's but whatever it was. I'm like, Oh yeah. my gosh, this is like my great grandparents house or something. Yes, that's, that's right. Go to. Yeah. And, um, so I've been talking about the link between stored memory and aroma for a while, but it was just nice to have you come with this very unique take on scent because uh, you'd done your doctoral dissertation and tons of research around scent and imagery. Mm-hmm. And I have yeah. your book here. So maybe um, maybe just share with our listeners how this found you, why this became a fascination for you and and what lent, you know, this work, what, what landed it in sure. your lap. Our teachers encouraged us to choose a research topic that we were passionate about or very Uh, irritated or some kind of strong emotion in in relationship to the topic. What was starting to happen to me in my second year of schooling was um, I was getting more and more obsessed with essential oils and bringing them to class and smelling them all the time and just smelling everything around me um, more acutely than I think I'd ever had. And my original topic, I decided to abandon and it became more clear that I was couldn't stop thinking and talking about smells. And so I, I started to explore that world. And it was a long process of narrowing down my research topic, as often is the case, you start with something quite general. I'm like, OK, I'm, a, I'm obsessed with smells and aromas. So what what about it? Where would I go from there? Because what um, were you getting your degree in? I was getting my degree in depth psychology with a uh, emphasis in somatic studies. Got it. And uh, so there needed to be a link between the body and the lived experience from the body from within uh, first person experience of the body and then the psyche. Uh, So that pretty much covers everything in the the human gauntlet, basically. Um, So I I felt drawn towards something that was one of our senses, in this case, uh, aroma and depth psychology also um, emphasizes the forgotten, the marginal, the hidden, the rejected, the, mm-hmm. the less talked about. And, and certainly smell um, is not forgotten or neglected, but compared to vision and, and um, our hearing, it's, it's a sense that we're, we're less, um, we don't give it as much attention. And so I, that was another reason I, I was drawn to it because it, it seemed to me that it deserved a little bit more attention. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. Yeah. It's not something I would have even explored until oils landed in my lap either. <laughs> um, <laughs> just because they are so concentrated. We'll get, we'll get to that in a minute about why essential oils are kind of a game changer when it comes to some of the, the ways that we can shift out of different states and mm-hmm. go into some more of that um, psychic imagery, but I want to, the name of your book is smell your reflections and the subtitle is on the soul's meaningful scent images. Yes. So my initial thing was like, wow, smell your reflections is so deep. Why don't you explain to us how, what the link is between imagery and scent, like psychic imagery and scent. It's a big topic. Um, and not easily, uh, explained in in a few uh, words, but I'll do my best. Um, the title is a little bit enigmatic, which was on purpose. Aromas are are less tangible; they're ephemeral, really. They they come and they go. Uh, even strong smells don't last forever. They are wispy and vaporous, and they're they're hard to grasp onto. And so the title, in a way, reflects that um, uh, intangibility of of smells. Um, In fact, we can't even properly measure them like you can with with the color spectrum and our uh, visual acuity. There's no defined vocabulary also for how to quantify or qualify smells. So they're very ambiguous. and, And I love that. You can't pin them down. They don't, they almost defy definition. And in a the way our our psyche is kind of like that too. Our dreams are like that. Think of how how easily you wake up from a, a dream, and within minutes, it's it's fading away, and then it's gone before you know it. And even a dream that's that's very powerful, within a few hours, 
it's it seems like it's it's vanished and you think gosh how could that be it was such a powerful dream and yet it's it's so out of reach and smells are kind of like that like the psyche um so the title smell your reflections uh had a few different levels to it but but one of them was the connection between smells and and psychic imagery and by imagery, I mean sense perceptions that we get from our five senses, but also spontaneous imagery. And it's not just visual. It could be a sound. It could be a, a texture, a feeling that arises on its own. And so the connection with smell to imagery is the was the area of my research that I, I felt I needed to explore more because not much had been written about it, at least that I could find. And... That was the exciting part because I started to discover that all smells more or less have to be connected to some image. Like you can't have a smell without an object or a place. You know, if it's a lemony smell, where's the lemony smell coming from? It has to come from an object or, or a place or something of that sort. So that smells can't be on their own. They can't stand alone. They, they're they always connected yeah. to some kind of image. Um, then each individual has a, a personal relationship to those images. You know, you could smell buttered popcorn and one person could have a, a memory image of, let's say, a movie theater. Another one has an image of movie night with their parents. Another one has an image of being sick after eating too much popcorn. And so the smell of, of buttered popcorn might be, the image might be very different um, for each person. So I started yeah. investigating those kinds of things. So interesting that we would link that, that that would be where the neurological pathways Mm. converge, right? I was just going to read mm -hmm. this part from your book where you go into a little bit more depth about that. And I think you quote Hillman here, smell is always of something. So imagining is always held within the bounds of a specific image. This image uh, right here under your nose, you go on to like, as you said, smells can't stand alone. They have to be linked to an image. So it's like, whether it's a stench, I guess, or a nice, beautiful, like mm -hmm. a rose. Mm -hmm. You said, however, many scents do not reach the ego and are therefore not experienced as a psychic image directly what do you want to go on a little bit about that how did it's, how does the smell not reach or a scent not reach the ego because most of our uh experiences were not conscious of i think that our capacity for for stimuli for all of our five senses you know the data that we're getting in in any given moment is of a limited amount there's we can't take in every stimuli in our environment. It would be overwhelming to us. So we selectively, this is done unconsciously, we pay attention to certain sounds and all the other sounds are ignored or pushed off to the side. In our visual field, we might be looking at a couple things and, and the rest of our visual field is sort of in the periphery. Sensations of the body, same thing. Most of the time, are you aware of your feet, your what your liver is doing, you know, the back of your, your neck? We might pay attention when we get an itch or something, but for the most part, we're, most of our days is, is unconscious we're uh, there's yeah, just a lot would about be on absolute overload <laughs> overload right yeah I and did so a, yeah sorry i just want to say here it's like i did a episode on sound healing mm. this is more smell healing <laughs> this, is, this mm. episode but it, she said the same thing like auditorily we cannot there are so many sounds that are coming through the auditory mm -hmm. pathway mm -hmm. that are being registered and processed for us born in behalf of our kind of through that reticular activating system that kind of filters out everything mm -hmm. for us so that we only that only comes to our awareness what's relevant yeah and um, and i am assuming that you're saying about smell like i guess in any yes. of the senses it would be that way there are things that we're seeing that we're not processing there are things that we're right. smelling that we're not consciously processing correct and so we typically pay attention to smells that are extremely pleasant or unpleasant or very strong the rest of smells are more or less unconscious. Um, nevertheless, we're still picking them up. So that is how you can have um, associations to smell that you may not directly remember experiencing, but when the association gets triggered, there is a, a response. So you could have a, a time in your life that was very terrible and you're focusing on other details, but let's say there is a smell that was connected with a, a really unpleasant experience. And then years later, you, you smell that and that 
that unpleasant experience comes rushing yeah. back to you. But the t- at the time, you weren't aware of that smell. You were focusing on other things. And so most of our associations and, and scent imagery are, are formed unconsciously. Mm-hmm. And usually in childhood and in early life, we're not aware of those things. So, um, That's, yeah, that, I, I had a lady, I was teaching class with an essential oil class years ago, and I was in, in Northern California. And um, it was probably about 12 women there. And there was a woman I was passing smells around at the end. And this is a woman who was very like her arms folded across her chest, very skeptical, very, I'm not going to get into this is mm-hmm. weird. And could just kind of see gradually the barriers breaking down a little bit, maybe on the subconscious level. But by the time I was passing things around and smelling them, she had a very visceral emotional response uh, when I passed around this mm-hmm. essential oil geranium. Mm -hmm. which most people don't love the smell of. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's okay, but it's very concentrated, very strong. Mm -hmm. And she explained very humbly to the class that when she was younger, she went to go visit her grandmother after school one day and her grandmother had, was in the backyard. She was calling, calling her grandmother, couldn't find her, found her in the backyard. She had collapsed. Well, her Mm. grandmother grew geraniums in the garden. Uh, and um, her grandmother ended up having, that was a stroke that her grandmother had. She was unconscious, but she would later mm-hmm. pass away. And so as a young girl, she had linked uh, the smell of geraniums, which she had not smelled in years, by the way, to yeah. death, to the death mm-hmm. specifically of her grandmother. So that was yeah. a very interesting, every, I find it fascinating that the human body through sensory input literally records almost everything. Right. <laughs> Even though we're not consciously, like you said, aware of the incoming stimuli. Yes. That's a great example. Very powerful. Um, another person could have an absolutely a euphoric experience with geranium, depending on the early association. So it's, it's a great yes. example. Um, and the key, I think, in that is the emotion. There's a lot of smells, actually most smells that we encounter every day that don't do much emotionally for us. They're neutral. They don't, they're neither good or bad. And they sort of fall to the wayside in, in a sense. But what's important, uh, I think, are, are those connections that are to smells that are, that are highly emotional. Mm. Um, those are the ones that I would argue that we would do well to pay attention to. And those are the ones that do break into our, our conscious awareness more often, uh, when there's a strong emotional component. So in the example you just spoke of, um, that woman, that was a very emotional experience for her and, and it got linked with the geranium smell. And so there's something about yeah, the emotion almost, that's very important. In, yes, in a, and almost like an emotional imprint of some sort. Yes. Um, yes. Are you familiar with that disorder? And the name has escaped me, but occasionally I will meet people who have lost their sense of smell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's called anosmia. Anosmia mm-hmm. or anos- anosmia. Yeah. Is it still having the same effect? I think it would, right? Even though they may not be able to differentiate a good smell from a... But does their... Do, how does that work? Because they don't know what it smells like in their awareness, right? But maybe on some mm-hmm. level they have an aversion or not. I don't. Are they still some getting the same psychic were, benefit or? Yeah, that's a good question. Some people are born without a sense of smell. A lot of other people lose it at different points in their life due to an accident, injury, a, a bacterial infection, a, a tumor, and so forth. So I don't know that if they are breathing in if any of those molecules are are able to attach to the the receptors in the olfactory cleft and then make it up to the brain i don't know at what point the disruption is has been blocked it might depend on each person but if if it was a situation where they became a no snake later in life they would of course still have scent associations but uh if they were born with that, then I don't know that they would ever form any never, yeah. uh, at all. So it's that's a that's a challenging one, but it's it's a condition that is more common than you would expect, and it's it's often undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, mm-hmm. and uh, it's quite terrible for people that have that. There's a high association with depression and even suicide. Uh, you wouldn't think something like 
loss of smell would be so severe, but it is very detrimental to people's quality of life. Think, and yeah, it just goes to show health. you how, how, yeah, how important it is. I mean, imagine not being able to um, smell your, your husband or wife or your children, that intimacy that comes with, with smell, uh, being able to enjoy food, yeah. Uh, all because taste is mostly smell, actually. So it's it's a very disruptive, condition. you know, unfortunate condition. Um, I I know you quote Helen Keller in here, and and she's one I've studied way yeah. since I was a girl. She's mm-hmm. just always fascinated me. I'm, yes. I I have a visual of her that was shown to me when I was younger of just smelling a rose, like a side profile of her smelling a rose. And it just touches mm-hmm. me because she basically navigated most of her life through scent and touch because obviously she couldn't see or hear. And I just, right. one quote I memorized, that's just, um, she said, smell is a potent wizard that transports mm-hmm. you across thousands of miles in all the years you've lived. Yes, beautiful. So like that potent wizard. Yes. Um, and she had obviously magnified and honed that sense of smell because that's how she enjoyed her life really and, and navigated. But yeah, you also quoted um, something in your book that I'm going to read here that she said, from her book, The World I Live In, or I don't know if it's a book or just an article, but what would odors signify if they were not associated associated with the time of the year, the place I live in and the people I know? Mm. Um, and it kind of rem- yes. reminds me of what we were just talking about. People who had never had the traditional sense of smell, who never were able to form those associations. It makes sense to me that there would be kind of a depression. I know that there are universities right now that are doing clinical trials on managing depression with scent Mm. and aromatic inhalers. Mm -hmm. What I know about the olfaction system is it's 10,000 times more sensitive and powerful than the sense of sight. Mm -hmm. And so there, and one of the you know, at least physiologically, like when you inhale something, it goes up through your nasal cavities, it hits your olfactory bulbs that kind of sit as an extension of your brain, really. Your nose is the only place in your body that is an extension of your mind brain. That's right. But those olfactory bulbs link in through tubes up in, this is very crude bio- biology <laughs> lesson, but they, they link up into your limbic system in your brain, which is your mm-hmm. emotional, the emotional center, the seat of all emotion in your brain. So stored memory, autonomic nervous functions, like heart rate and respiration. And of course, that imagery you're talking about, the, mm-hmm. the visual associations. And the, so, yeah, I mean, stored memory is a, I know of some therapists who employ scent and aromatherapy for PTSD with some success. There's a, it seems to be yeah. able to facilitate a, a gentler release of those emotions or visual memories. Yeah, you bring up a good point. And I'd, and I'd like to, to point out one thing um, from a clinical standpoint that I, it came to understand a little bit more deeply through my research because I had been using essential oils in my clinic. I do Chinese medicine, and it was just it was in addition to the work I was doing aromatherapy. And I took clinical aromatherapy on how to use the essential oils on acupuncture points uh, mm-hmm. physiologically. But what I came to realize with the smells and using them for psychological healing, so for something like depression is that there are no universal smells that will be the magic bullet for for everybody. In other words, that lavender or geranium or jasmine, it may be very helpful for one person and in another person, it could be an aversion and it yeah. may not help whatsoever. So what seems to be the important piece, if you're going to use essential oils or aromatherapy for more of the psychological component, let's say for depression, is you're going to have to do a little more digging. You're going to have to to find a scent that that person either has a strong positive association or try to form a new association through a, a smell that they've never had before and link it to something really uh, enjoyable. So if if you would dig deep with somebody and, and go back to, let's say, childhood and talk about times in their life that they felt joy, times in their life that they felt safe, for example, and, and you can come up with something, experience, and then see if you can find an, an odor that's linked to it. So let's say somebody grew up on a farm with horses, and they said, the only happy time in my life is when I was riding horses. You would try to find a way to bring 
the smell of horses, let's say, into the therapeutic context, which is not easy to do, but that would be the idea. Mm. And, and so from that standpoint, the smell of horses would be perhaps an antidote to depression rather than some arbitrary smell like jasmine or lavender, which may not do anything for the person, right. but the smell of horses, that's the, that's the emotional, the, the personal, it has to be personal. And it, it takes a little more you know, work on, on the part of the patient and therapist, but I think you're going to get closer to a more effective remedy if you, if you start going to the idiosyncratic personal emotional associations with smell rather than some generic smell that's been sure. researched just for, for this you know, property. For the universal something. aspects. That's a good point. I remember yeah. when I first smelled frankincense, which this would have been, I have to think, maybe 15 years ago. And I was, you know, you hear about frankincense and myrrh, you know, through biblical texts and mm -hmm. some of the aromatic compounds that have existed indigenously for thousands of years, especially the frankincense. There were, they found found frankincense resin, resin in the Egyptian catacombs. This has mm -hmm. been around for a while. But I remember when I was just, I don't know what I had in my mind that it would smell like, but I did not like the smell. Mm -hmm. I actually had like a gag reflex coming up. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's really interesting because mm -hmm. at that time in my life, I was working through some mm, emotional, spiritual issues. And uh, when I found out what the properties for frankincense were, and, and again, this is a universal aspect, um, but it was like spot on for why I would mm -hmm. have had an emotional aversion at that time. But now mm -hmm. I could mainline it. Like I am just <laughs> enamored with the smell of frankincense. It's intoxicating to me. So it's mm -hmm. interesting that when I dove into yeah. the emotions um, that were that this Honestly, the frankincense was eliciting and bringing mm. to the forefront mm -hmm. from the subconscious. It was allowing me to move through that and, and mm. almost became a companion to me, to my, to my soul psyche. <laughs> That's that's beautiful. And that last little phrase you you just said, the companion to your soul psyche, I would say that's one of the uh, meanings of of the title uh, Smell Your Reflections. It, it is developing a relationship to smells, mm -hmm. smells that are personal and meaningful to you, to you and smelling your own reflections, having a companion, making smells become part of your, your characters and your psyche that they, you befriend, you befriend mm -hmm. them, you know, as you would look at, um, at yourself in the mirror and, and say hello, that, that befriending, that companionship and, and that smells can be a lifelong companion. Um, yeah. I think, I think that's like a your friends, your buddies, you just, yeah, yes. and I have my favorite, yes. I have my favorite, favorite scents. Yeah. And one thing that I've done for myself, just because I, I mean, I love rose essential oil, but it's very concentrated. So mm -hmm. I just go get roses for myself every time I go to the grocery store nice. yeah. and I literally stop and smell the roses. I put them right mm -hmm. in the kitchen. Um, it only happens like once a month probably, but yeah. it's just like, oh yeah, like this does something. This is yeah. very elevating. I want to ask you from your research search and, and the time that you've spent around this, what, what do you think the link is between smell or the olfactory system and spirituality? And maybe we've already crossed that a little bit. Well, let's, um, I'm going to toss the ball back into your court for a minute. Um, I would like to hear your brief definition of, of what spirituality, spirituality is. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Because everybody sees it differently, I suppose. For me, spirituality is coming into, it's, it's like coming back home, but inside of yourself. So it, it, it's mm -hmm. like a connection to your own divine soul, which is connected to God and the all. Okay. So like a, um, a relationship between the deeply personal and the more than personal or the transpersonal or something beyond. Yeah. So, so that it's relationship. You, right. Yeah. So it's connection within your soul and your own mm -hmm. divine spirit, which is then connected to the all or the mm -hmm. beyond. Yeah. The, the beyond okay. you. <laughs> sure. Uh, thanks for, yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Um, so I would say, the the link between aromas and spirit which by the way goes back a very very long way the the word soul uh is often or i'm sorry spirit is often connected to uh, pneuma or breath and there's a link um 
etymologically, linguistically between the word spirit, the word breath, and the vapor of, of smell. The old ancient mm. philosopher before Plato, even um, Heraclitus, he says the, the souls in the underworld perceived by smelling. And if, if that's all that we had, uh, one would, would know the world through scent only. So there's an old, old wow. relationship between um, spirit and breath and aroma. So that's just a kind of a historical background to those words, but um, kind of bringing it more into your question um, between the, the relationship between a smell and, and spirit, based off of your definition, I would say that the smell could be the bridge or the link between the deeply personal and the more than personal. If you think of the world as, as a great tapestry, a, a smellscape of millions of different aromas that were here before us and will exist maybe beyond us, and that we get to experience the world of aromas, and that each of those smells can be more personal to each each individual has a different relationship to those those smells so let's say everybody in a town might smell the eucalyptus trees that are growing everywhere but each person is going to have a different individual deeply personal experience to the eucalyptus tree smell and so there's that i look at smells as a bridge it's it's something that we can all experienced uh, together, but we have our own relationship um, to it. So from a spiritual standpoint, I would say the smells connect us to the more than personal. We, we bring them into us. Um, we have our memories, we have our emotions, we have our images that are that are highly specific to each person, but that connects us to the greater world. It's, it's that link to the um, to the more than personal. The bridge. I just learned that the word shaman literally means bridge. Mm. And so as I'm listening to you, I'm like, oh, they're like little shamans. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yes, they are like little um, shamans. Because there's something yes. when you smell a beautiful aromatic compound or the synergy of, you know, a blend, let's just say a blend of essential of different essential oils, it's like it transcends thought. And what I learned anatomically about mm. that is that when you smell something, it bypasses the yes. logic brain. That's right. So it's only lived experience. It's only a visceral kind of thing. It's like, you're not thinking about it. It's, it's, it's bypassing the parts of your brain that are typically analyzing things. That's right. Yeah. It bypasses the frontal cortex, goes right to the amygdala, um, the brainstem and, and only later can, do we reflect on it? Right. The reflection comes later. What does this mean? What's it, you know, what's it about? That comes later. But the immediate, like you said, uh, direct experience is visceral, it's embodied and it's emotional and therefore maybe more primal. Um, hmm. in a way. I mean, it's it's been theorized that the, the limbic system, particularly the mammalian brainstem, is the oldest part of our brain and therefore the olfactory system would be. Um, perhaps or even our first sense that's that's hypothesized so you're absolutely right it, it goes right to the to the oldest part of our our humanness yeah and i'm so grateful that you brought up the amygdala and the the ability that some of these aromatic molecules have to enter into that space which is not an easy space to enter no somebody some people say that it is where it, it does like it is the house of fear right it, it, there's some of our animal emotions and some of our fight flight or freeze mm -hmm. come from there but also our memory but also the spiritual mm -hmm. and some people even call it kind of like similar to the third eye like the mm. pineal gland and, and those things that it's that Shakti area mm -hmm. that, that it's very akin to like a third eye type of function or perception and seeing into the spiritual. Yeah. So, yeah. so much to explore there. Um, I want to kind of circle this back to essential oils because I have a lot of listeners who mm -hmm. love essential oils and use them and some who don't, and that's totally fine. We forgive them, but <laughs> um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what have you seen between the, the, the topical, I mean, because there's different uses, but we'll just stick with topical and aromatic use. You and I talked in our pre-conversation about the impacts of both, how they impact us differently physiologically and psycho psychologically, like mm -hmm. topical versus uh, aromatic use. Yeah. I would say that 
in general, the topical application of essential oils are going to affect the physiology of our bodies, while the aromas will have an affinity towards the psychological and emotional. That's a generalized uh, statement. Um, there's some overlap, of course. I think you have to be a little bit more careful applying essential oils directly on the body to induce physiological changes. As you know, essential oils are very concentrated, often mm -hmm. very pow powerful. Each person's going to have a, a slightly different response to them. They get absorbed into uh, in, through the skin and then into the uh, bloodstream. So they need to be used carefully when they're applied on the body. They are the the essence of the plant. They are its sexual juices, so to speak, and so should be t used with reverence. Uh, same way we would use honey. You know, this is the concentrated mm. pollen that the bees use. It takes a lot of flowers for the bees to make the honey, and it takes a lot of energy for the plants to produce their yeah, their, it, their oils. And so I look at them as very precious. They're they're very strong, and I think putting them in a carrier oil like jojoba or fractionated coconut oil can kind of ease ease the oil into the body that way. But um, I think they're great on the body. You just have to be really careful. Uh, but I think you're going to see more of a physiological effect when they're applied topically. You're yeah. also going to get the smell, of course, um, when you're applying them topically. But um, if you're if you're interested more in the the emotional component, I think you can you can gain just as much or more just by the inhalation of the smell without necessarily even applying them on the body. Um, so I, for example, will put some drops of oil on my pillow before night. But, you know, before I go to sleep and I'm, I'm in kind of bathed in a cloud of, of the aromatic molecules and they don't necessarily go on my skin. So th there's many ways of, of using them, of course, in that way. So that's kind of a general, yeah. a general rule. Yeah, that's been my experience. I think that um, people generally think of the oils as just a nice smell. They don't understand yeah. that they are very potent chemically. Yeah. And um the complex, latest, yeah, very, complex. very compl like to, uh, frankincense. Let's just say, for instance, um, frankincense is one of the most complex. Mm -hmm. It has over 200 different chemical constituents. Mm -hmm. And so there's just so much research. There's this like stuff that you can look up on pubmed.gov. I always tell people mm -hmm. there is science to this. There are mm -hmm. chemical constituents with these within these oils that are being used for many, many, many things. But in a nutshell, yeah, I, like let's just take lavender. And this goes back to what you were saying before, like some, some could smell lavender and have this maybe maybe like a euphoric type of experience or um, maybe let's just say it gives them a sedative type of effect where it really relaxes their central nervous system and calms their right. breathing for another person it could be excitatory exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so we do, and I've experienced that with my children trying to get them to sleep mm -hmm. one kid would be zonked and the other kid would be like where's the party <laughs> and yeah so we really do. I love yeah. what you're saying about the personalizing. I absolutely love that, especially um, I work with some people who use them in the therapeutic settings. Mm. And so bringing that individualized uh, component into those settings where they're able to maybe work with that scent until it either loses its aversion or Mm -hmm. They are able to make new associations because one mm -hmm. thing that I have learned about essential oils is their ability through repetition, oftentimes mm -hmm. to make consistent new associations to the mind body. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly what you're saying about imagery. Yeah, it's it's easier to do that if, if you don't already have established associations uh, from childhood. If it's a new smell, even better. Uh, if you're trying to, let's say, use a smell for memorization of like a test or something, you would want to seek out uh, an oil that a smell that you've never smelled before and you would, and you could create new, new pathways um, to do that. But if it's a smell that you have a strong association with, especially from childhood, they're very difficult to, to change once they've been established initially. Um, so if you are going to try to do something like that, better to have a neutral oil or something that's that's something more benign, like everyone loves, like orange or something. <laughs> yeah. Or even better yet, something obscure and totally new. That way you can it's a new. It's oh, like got a, it. oh, oh. Yeah. Oh, like, like an open template. You know, if you're choosing if you're trying to choose an 
an oil, like you mentioned lavender, keep in mind, if you're talking about essential oils, keep in mind that there's many different types of lavender, for example. And if you if you start sampling different ones, you you, you start noticing subtleties and different differentiations. And they vary from, from company to company and even from batch to batch. And once you become more uh, attuned to that, you'll be like, oh, I like spike lavender, but I don't like French lavender. Or I like French lavender, but I, I don't like Romanian lavender because there's so many different kinds of yeah. lavender. And once you can kind of start to differentiate those, then it, then that you're, you're moving in direction that's more idiosyncratic or personal. And, and that's where the refinement comes in where you're like, oh, I really like this one. And I don't like this one. I, I like this, this company and I don't like this company. Cause yeah, what I found is be, like where you adulterated, they add totally. sugars to one. Yeah. Fillers. Yeah. Well, one, fillers, I'm glad you brought right. that up because the chemical profile of a lavender that's grown maybe in the U.S. somewhere, the U.S. West, we'll say, mm -hmm. versus one that's in the high altitudes of France has a, comp they have completely different chemical profiles. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. The, I used doTERRA essential oils. It's been a big part of my career actually is mm -hmm. um, traveling and teaching about essential oils through doTERRA. It's, a, it's, mm -hmm. um, just a, I was just blessed to ha and happened to join the company at the very beginning. Nice. So I've seen this. Um, it's now the largest essential oils company in the world. And I've seen the, the genesis of, of how oils, um, especially I think because people are moving more into those indigenous therapies and the healing arts and more of, I guess, that feminine consciousness where mm -hmm. you're talking about going into the depth mm -hmm. and going into what's been hidden going underneath, mm -hmm. which is a very feminine energy. Mm -hmm. um, but what I've noticed is that there is no one, and I'm glad you brought this up earlier. There's no one size fits all. Like mm -mm. there's a really beautiful book called the fragrant heavens. Have you ever heard of that book by no. Valerie Wormwood? Is, is that who wrote that? I'm familiar with the author. Yeah. She wrote this beautiful the book. The fragrant mind. Um, no, so, yeah. She, I'm, she I'll look it up while she, we're talking. She probably has other books. I know the author. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I read that before I even like really started journeying with essential oils. Yeah. It's that it's called the fragrant heavens by mm. Valerie War Warwood. I always want to call her Wormwood because that's, <laughs> that's an herb. Um, but yeah, it's just like, it's your own heaven. It's your own body. And uh, you get to be the alchemist of mm. what creates that divine spark in you and how your spirituality or your sense quote unquote is is reflected back to you um so now i think i'm understanding the title of your book <laughs> <laughs> very good Smell it has your many reflection. layers to it it can be read and yeah it has many layers you could you could get at it from different different ways but you you brought up that really important point that it's a relationship that each person has to both spirit, to both the, the world of aromas, to each individual scent. And it's an ongoing relationship like you would have with a friend or uh, a family member. And that That's so beautiful. It can change, change over time. And, and like all friendships, like, like Plato and Aristotle said, friendship is something to be cultivated, to be nurtured, that it's a, it's work, but it's, it's a, one of life's great, great gifts. Yes. Thank you. And I want to end with this quote by Rumi mm. that you have in your book. He says, if anyone wants to know what spirit is or what God's fragrance means, lean your hand toward him or her. Keep your face there close like this. So God's mm. fragrance. I love that. Yeah, that's great. How can we find you, Brian, online? Um, my website is unifiedmedicine.com. Perfect. And your book is on Amazon, I'm assuming. It is. Smell your reflections. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time today. I, this has You're been super welcome. informative. My, my pleasure. Always, always enjoy talking with you and, and speaking about the world of aromas. And uh, it's, it's unending. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful endless. Stuff. Yeah. Yes. 
hope this was a meaningful exploration for you diving into the really understated, I would say, science of aroma. Um, even though our ancient wise women, healers, shamans, priestesses, saints, sages, mystics, yogis, they all knew about the power of aroma and its impact upon our psychological and spiritual well-being. So you can, again, find Brian on unifiedmedicine.com. Grab his book, Smell Your Reflections, and continue to follow me on Instagram, Soul Essential Cherie, as well as Cherie.Burton. And, of course, our lovely Facebook community, Women Seeking Wholeness, asked to join that group more drawings more fun more exploration with devotional self-care and always doing lots of giveaways throughout the spring and summer so hope you have a glorious week and we will talk to you next time on women seeking wholeness